Welcome to The Rock Church and World Outreach Center. We pray that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a message from Pastor Luke Cobray. So Father, we come before you, Lord, and we're just grateful for the opportunity that we have to be here today. Lord, it's just such a privilege that we get to come into the house of God and to worship you, to lift up the name of Jesus. We don't come here to hear from a man. We don't come from tradition. We don't come from entertainment. But Lord, we come to hear from you. And we acknowledge that it's your son, Jesus, that's the leader of this house. And in the name of Jesus, we ask that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher today, would be our counselor, would teach us and show us and reveal to us your word today, Lord. I pray that it would be alive, God, that it would equip us to to walk out of the walls of this building and to really be your church for the lost and the dying world to see your glory. And so, Father, we thank you for all that you've blessed us with. We don't ask this upon ourselves, but Lord, upon all the churches across the Inland Empire and around the, the, uh, the world that are preaching and hearing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, today we ask that you would bless our Catholic brothers and sisters and our churches, uh, the, the brothers and sisters that belong to all the various denominations that preach and teach the gospel of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Lord, we thank you for our Calvary Chapel brothers and sisters all across the Inland Empire. Father, I ask that you'd bless churches like Pastor Greg and, uh, and the Harvest and, and the Grove. Lord, I ask that you bless Pastor Matt and Sandals. And Lord, thank you for uh, Pastor Marcus in the way. Lord, Pastor Danny and Water of Life. Lord, I thank you that you'd bless Pastor Rob and Emmanuel Baptist and Ecclesia. Lord, I thank you that your hand would be upon Pastor Ken and New Creation. Lord, all the churches across the Inland Empire and, and around the world, Lord, we ask that you would bless them as you've blessed us. Father, we thank you that your Holy Spirit would speak to them as you've spoken to us, Lord, because we are all many members of the team working together to build your kingdom for your glory. So, Father, to you be the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we all said, amen. Amen. Well, it's just good to be in the house of God with you today. As you can tell, I just, I think we can have some fun in church. I think we can smile. It's good. And before we get into the Word of God, I wanted to just kind of tell you something a little bit lighthearted, just kind of introduce what we're talking about today. So I'm going to tell you, there was a, I heard a story of a a man and a woman, a husband and a wife, and and every morning they woke up, they would argue with each other. Some of you are like, amen, hallelujah, I know what you're talking about. Every morning when they woke up, they would argue with each other of whose responsibility it was to make the coffee for the house. The wife would say it's the husband's responsibility and the husband would say, no, you know, honey, you cook, you clean, you do all that stuff as your response, it falls under, it falls under your, you know, and, and they would go back and forth arguing, arguing. Finally, one day the wife says to the husband, I've got the answer. The Bible clearly tells us that it's the husband's responsibility to make the coffee. The husband doubtingly looks over to the wife and he says, I don't believe it, prove it. And so there she grabs her Bible and she opens it up and she says, not only does the Bible tell us that it's the husband's responsibility to make the coffee, it gives us an entire book that outlines that. The book is called He Brews. Well, today, if you've got your Bibles, open with me to the book of Hebrews and let's get into our study of how to make coffee. No, okay, I'm just kidding. We're not really talking about coffee. (laughs) But if you are just joining us, we have been going through the the book of Hebrews. One of the things that we do here at The Rock is we go line upon line, precept upon precept. We've been in the book of Hebrews for quite some time, and we're in the 11th chapter. I mean, like, the best part of the the book of Hebrews to be in. It's like the playground. We're just having so much fun talking about faith. We've been spending since the beginning of the year learning of what faith is. And now we're looking at the subject of faith in action and what faith looks like when it's put to use as we've learned that faith does not work by itself, that it's, it's combined with our life and the actions of our lives. And so we're in this subject of faith in action. And the title of this message is part two from what we talked about last week of faith in worship. The very first example we see of faith in action is the illustration of Abel in worship to God or or giving a gift or offering to God. And we're going to look at the subject here of faith in worship, part number two. Now, if you didn't hear part number two, Part number one, I would really strongly encourage you to go grab the CD after service or you can go online and, and, and visit us on the web page and just listen to the message or if, if you've got the ability or the time, go back and watch the message online. I tell you, if you haven't heard it, you need to get it. It'll change your life. It'll really begin to bless you as well as if you did hear it, Good to listen to it again. We learned about worship, and I want to kind of just recap some very important things when we talk about the subject of faith and worship. Worship is not, let's talk about what worship isn't. Worship is not the slow song of church. 
All right, so when we're talking about faith and worship, we're not talking about the slow portion of the music segment of church. That's not just worship. Now, what worship really is, I have it on the, on the screens, is worship is the expression of adoration and reverence to God. So you can see how worship would apply to us. Like we can, in song, because oftentimes in song we're expressing our adoration and our reverence to God. But you see, we learned last week that worship goes so far beyond just singing. Worship has something to do with coming to God His way, His desire. And as we saw with Cain and Abel, Abel came to God on God's terms, whereas Cain came, uh, Cain came to God on his own terms. God blessed Abel and his offering, but God did not bless or accept Cain and his offering. So we learn that worship is not about uh, the actions because it, it's not just about the actions, I should say, because the Bible tells us that God examines the gift and the giver. And so we learn that worship goes deeper than just what we do on the outside. If you remember, we talked about the vinegar and water. Vinegar and water look exactly the same from the outside, but on the inside, they're very different from each other. And so we learn that God looks at the gift or the giver from the inside out. And so worship really starts with our hearts, the expression of adoration and reverence to God. Today, I want to continue in on that subject of faith and worship by, again, looking at Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 4. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 4, again, talking about Abel, says that by faith, Talking about faith in action. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So Abel brings this offering to God, and it's because he heard. The Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. Abel was operating in what God had, op uh, had asked or had instructed him, either through his parents or however, we don't know. But Abel was operating through faith in God. And having, having uh, a more excellent sacrifice than Cain through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts. And through it, his faith and his gift, he being dead still speaks. Today I want to continue looking at this subject of faith, uh, uh, faith in worship by looking at this word that's so important for you and I, this word righteous. The Bible tells us that through Abel's faith in his worship, through his more excellent sacrifice that he did by going to God through faith, that he obtained witness that he was righteous. Righteous is a huge word for you and I. What does it mean to be righteous? Let's talk about that for a moment. What does it mean to be righteous? Well, in our day and age, when we look at righteousness or to be righteous, we would define it as being justified, taking maybe the moral high ground. You know the thing about that term righteousness or justification is every human being on the face of the earth wants justification. We want to be justified to, to know that we're doing what we're doing for a reason. To live why we live for a reason. To make the decisions that we've made. We want justification to say that we've made those for a reason. Men has, men, mankind has done all sorts of different things throughout the history of humanity in the name of justification. We all seek to be justified. So here in Hebrews, it tells us that through his gift, through his faith, he obtained witness that he was righteous. What does it mean to be righteous? Well, in the King James Version, if you look at righteousness, righteousness is literally translated right wiseness. Or to be, uh, we'll say it like this, we'll translate it really easy. I'll give you a real simple definition. Righteousness is simply this, right standing with God which means that you are in the right position with God, in the right viewpoint of God. To be righteous means that you are, how about we'll just put it like this, you are good with God. And so uh, we all desire this. You know, I know that we, I can say that because that's why you're here today. Because you want that, to be in right standing with God. That's why we come. That's why we get into the Word of God. That's why we're doing what we're doing is to find righteousness in our lives. And you see, this term, righteousness, is critical, is crucial to our understanding of, of, of our position with God and in righteousness. So you see, Abel brought a gift, an offering to God. And through that, the Lord respected, as Genesis tells us, Abel and his offering. Hebrews takes it one step further and says, by faith Abel brought that and Lord, the Lord testified or he obtained witness. Literally means that, obtained witness literally means to have a report. So it was written, it was accounted to him for righteousness. So we see that Abel brought a sacrifice, a gift to God in worship and God respected him and he had a witness of righteousness. If you look at the Old Testament, 
They brought offerings. They made atonement. They had sacrifices that would cover the sin of mankind. The shedding of innocent blood covered the travesty of sin on mankind. And because of that innocent blood or because of that sacrifice, man had atonement or forgiveness or the remission of sins. And so we find that through sacrifice, man found themselves in the position of right standing with God because of that. But you see, you and I, we live in a very different time. We no longer sacrifice. We no longer have ceremonies where we give of innocent blood to cover our sins. And do you know why we don't do that anymore? Because 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary became the final sacrifice for humanity, so that we could be clean, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be righteous in the eyes and in the viewpoint of God. Second Corinthians, in the fifth chapter, verse number 21 says that God made him, who's him? Jesus. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him, in him. God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. Think about that for a moment. Jesus Christ, the perfect, the spotless lamb of God, the only human being on the face of the earth who ever lived a sinless life. God took him, his only begotten son, and didn't just nail him to a cross so that we would be forgiven. It says that he made him to be sin. He took the weight of the sin nature of humanity so that we could become the righteousness of God because we think so, because we want to. So that Jesus Christ died so that we could act righteous. Jesus Christ died so that we could think righteous. It doesn't say that. It says Jesus Christ died so that we could become the righteousness of you and me. No, God in him. So what that means to you and I, so important. The foundation of what we're talking about today is this, that your righteousness is not based on what you do. Your righteousness is based on what Jesus Christ already did. Amen. Abel brought an offering and he had a witness. You and I have the offering made for us by God. Therefore, our righteousness is not based on our actions. It's not based on the outward appearance. Our righteousness is not based on what we do, but what was already done for us, the sacrifice. And you notice how it says that we might become the righteousness of God in him. You see, your righteousness is not for you. It's of God. It's God's righteousness on you. Why? Because literally on the cross of Calvary, a transaction took place. Jesus Christ took our place with sin and death, and instead, he gave us his position of righteousness. And I'm going to take a little segue, and I promise it'll all make sense in just a moment. When we built this building here, this, this, this big building and all of the campus here, when we built this building, great care had to be taken when laying the foundation. You see, in the Inland Valley, in the Inland Valley this was a great floodplain. And so the ground here is very uh, sandy. It's very, uh, it's very loose soil. In my backyard, if I dig deeper than two or three feet, I'll find big rocks because this was an ancient riverbed or floodplain. And, and there's, a, there's a process of our land called liquefaction. Liquefaction literally means that in the event of an earthquake or a shaking of the ground, the, 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 the soil takes the properties of liquid. Think of it like this. If you were to take a big salad bowl and fill it with play sand, and then you were to build a sand castle inside of that salad bowl. If you took that salad bowl and you shook that salad bowl, what would happen to your sand castle? It would crumble and it would flat and it would level out like water seeks to be leveled. That's liquefaction. 
So when we built this building, in order to withstand a big earthquake or the shaking of the ground, we had to take great care in building the foundation. We had to dig deep into the ground and send big pylons and pilasters down into the ground to, to anchor this building because in the event of an earthquake, the ground takes the properties of liquid and we don't want this building to fall apart. You understand this, that in the building process, the foundation is the most important part of the structure. Because if the foundation is weak or the foundation fails, then the walls get out of plumb. If the walls get out of plumb, then the windows crack or the doors don't shut right. If the, if the foundation fails, then the roof shifts. And if the roof shifts, then water infiltrates the house. And if water infiltrates the house, then you've got mold and damage. So you, have, you understand that the foundation is very important, the most important part of the building process. This right here is the foundation for you and I in our beliefs. The foundation that our righteousness, our justification, or even like this, our right standing with God, our position, is not based on what we do or did, it's based on what Jesus Christ has already done. When we build our foundation of our beliefs on that, when our world begins to shake because of something that's coming our way, we don't find liquefaction. Why? Because we have built our house, our life on the rock. You remember that old hymn, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand? Jesus even instructed us to build our house on the rock because somebody who hears the words of Christ and does not do them is like the person who builds on the sand and the waves and the wind and the shore will wipe that house out. This is the foundation of our belief. If we build on the foundation of Christianity, that if we do good, that if we look good, that if we listen to KSGN or 90.1, that if we've got a bumper sticker on our car, that if we go to church once a week or we try to go twice a week or we go to church once a month or we go to church on Easter, if we follow the rules and regulations, when we build a foundation of our belief on that, what we're doing is we're building a foundation on shaky ground that will not stand when life shakes us. We've got to learn to build on the rock. And the rock is that your right standing with God is not based on you. Your right standing with God is based on Jesus. Then we have a solid foundation. That's the foundation of what I want to talk about today. We'll, we'll continue thinking on that. And so as we understand that our righteousness is not based on us, there's, there's some more important things that we need to understand. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to the book of Romans in the third chapter. Romans in the third chapter, Paul the Apostle is writing, and man, I'll tell you, Paul really nails, nails it home with us on this one. He really drives it home. In Romans in the third chapter, we're going to read some things about righteousness, about the subject, understanding that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ. And now with that, with the understanding that our righteousness is not based on us, but based on Jesus, let's look at what it says in Romans, the third chapter. Beginning in verse number 21, it says, The righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed. What does that mean? The righteousness of God apart from the works. How about this? The righteousness of God apart from your actions is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus, that's important, to all and on all who believe, for there is no difference. So the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ is on and for everybody who believes in Jesus, because there is no difference. Why is there no difference? Whether you were born Jew or born Greek, whether you have this bloodline or you have that bloodline, here's the reason why. Verse number 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned, which means every person on the face of the earth through the genetic DNA that's on the inside of us have made mistakes that have separated us from God. Not about one or the other, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
But I love this. The Bible says being justified freely by his, God's grace, his sovereign divine ability to get the job done on our behalf when we can't do it. Why can't we do it? Because we've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. But Pastor Luke, I've never murdered. I've never committed adultery. I, I, I don't covet. I don't. Jesus took it so far as to say, men, if you look at a woman with lust in your eyes, you've already committed adultery. He takes it even further by saying, if you've got offense with a brother in your heart, you're committing murder. We are guilty of sin. But because of God's grace, his divine ability to get the job done when we couldn't do it, we couldn't buy it. We couldn't earn it. We couldn't work for it. He freely justified us, put us in the position of right standing, righteousness with him because of Jesus Christ. Verse number 25, of whom God set forth as a propitiation. What? A replacement to stand in the gap, to take the place of our sin nature. Jesus became sin. A propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his Righteousness. You hear that? His righteousness, not your righteousness. God in his forbearance passed over the sins that were previously committed. Verse number 26, again, to demonstrate his righteousness. Whose righteousness? His. Because our righteousness is not based on what we do. It's based on Jesus Christ and what he did. Our righteousness is the righteousness of God in Christ to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. You know what this means? Our righteousness is the righteousness of God in Christ. So if our righteousness is not based on what we do, and our righteousness is the righteousness of God in Christ, you know what that means for you and I? That righteousness... Right standing with God is not a state of mind, it's a matter of fact. Think about that for a moment. If righteousness was based on feelings, oh, we'd be in trouble. If righteousness was based on emotions, we'd have some problems. If our righteousness was based on our actions and all that we do and only what we do, we'd have a lot of shortcomings. But you see, God demonstrated his righteousness for us through Jesus Christ. That when we believe and when we call on upon the name of Jesus Christ, something happens on the inside of us and it is no longer us, like Paul says, no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Why? Because it's not our righteousness. It's the righteousness of God in Christ in us. Which means if God said it through his word that when we believe in Jesus, we have the righteousness of God, God cannot lie. And if God says that through his word, that means it's a matter of fact. Your right standing with God is not based on what you do, but what on, what, upon what Jesus Christ did. Your right standing with God is not based upon how you feel about it at the moment. I love how Hebrews talks about uh, uh, Abel. Tells us that Abel had witness of righteousness. God testifies of his gifts. He speaks, although he's still dead. You know what that sounds like to me? That sounds a lot, an awful lot like a courtroom, a, a trial. Abel, on, in the courtroom of his soul, bringing an offering to God for the penalty that was brought against him. The penalty is sin, the separation of God, punish, punishable by death. There he's brought uh, the, this, this accusation by the accuser of the brethren, as the Bible calls the devil. But there, on this trial, in this courtroom of his life, Abel has a witness. His offering, his faith, his alignment, his heart with God that says he is righteous. The accusations against him are no longer applied and he is righteous. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us that God testifies. The creator of the universe, the almighty judge of all things good and all things evil, God stands up from his position and he stands. That person is justified because of their witness. You and I have a witness. Jesus Christ is the witness for you and I. Sin comes into our life, feelings, thoughts, and emotions speak against our righteousness. And we say, man, I don't know if I have that. But we have a witness that says, I was there. 
I died on the cross. You are justified because you have called on me. Think about it for a moment. In your own life, I promise this isn't deep, so don't go, don't go too far in thought. In your own life, who is the only one that can determine who is right with you? You. It's not that hard. You. You're the only one that knows who's right with you. Somebody could come and say, oh, man, we're good. You know, we're good. We're, 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 we're like family. We're, we're like, we're besties, BFFs or whatever it is. <laughs> but only you know who is right with you. Somebody could think that they're right with you, but you could say, Psh, I just smile at you. We're not really good. <laughs> the same thing applies to God. God is the only one who can testify to who is right with him. And Hebrews 11.4 tells us that God testifies of Abel's gifts, operating in worship through faith. God testified, stood up and said, that man is in right standing with me. When you and I call upon the name of Jesus Christ in our lives, Jesus Christ stands as our witness and says, I was there, they are clean. And God stands up and he says, the only one who can testify who is in right standing with me is me, and I will testify on their behalf that they are righteous because of the gift of Jesus Christ who call upon Jesus. Thank God it's not based on how we feel. Why? Because as we learned last week, that we can look good on the outside. Everything can be prim and proper. We can dress good for church and we can raise our hands and sing louder than anybody else. We can, we can have the bumper sticker on our car. We can come to church on a regular basis and everything on the outside appears to be good, but on the inside, we're like vinegar. But when we call upon the name of Jesus Christ, let me tell you something. Our righteousness isn't based on what we do. It's based on what he did. So now here we are, you and I, on the inside, nasty, murky, yucky looking. Now, we don't even look good on the outside. Last week was hypothetical. You know why we don't look good on the outside? It's called rush hour traffic. That's why we don't look good on the outside. When so You say, what do you mean, Pastor Luke? When somebody cuts you off, the initial reaction, that's it. There it is. We don't even look good. You see, we're murky on the inside. And we come to God and we say, God, if, if righteousness is based on what I do, then no matter what I add, nothing can, can take away the sting of my life on the inside. But the Bible tells us that we're the righteousness of God through Christ. And so here's Jesus, perfect and spotless, clean on the inside and on the outside. And we strive to be like him. But when we realize and we begin to recognize that our righteousness is not in him, but rather we are in Christ, what happens is we begin to pour out what's on the inside and it becomes what's on the outside. Uh-oh. I didn't give all my heart to Jesus. And now we have the righteousness of God through Christ on the inside, not just the outside, because our right standing with God is not based on what we do. It's based on the fact that Jesus Christ died for our sins. And when we call upon his name as the savior of our lives, we are washed from the inside out. Now, some of you are like, wait, how did he do that? You say, a good magician never reveals his secrets. I'll tell you afterwards. It's not a secret. It's nothing, nothing more than just simple chemistry. I'll tell you afterwards. I want you to focus on what we're talking about. But because, just like you got excited, because we are washed and cleansed from the outside, that's what brings righteousness into the subject of faith and worship. Because now, bringing it home to the subject of faith and worship, faith and worship recognizes that it's not us or we're not righteous or in right standing with God because of us, but because of Jesus. And just like you hooting and hollering because we've been washed on the inside, that produces something on the inside of us, a gratitude 
A realization that we can now, like Hebrews, the 10th chapter, like Hebrews, the 4th chapter says, let us go boldly before the throne of grace uh, to obtain mercy in time of need. We now have access to God. Why? Because we're not murky and dirty and nasty on the inside. We would never be able to go before God with that type of life on the inside. But now because of Jesus, in the eyes of God, when we go before God, even though we may not feel like it, even though we may not be thinking like it, when we go before for God because of Jesus Christ on the inside of us, God sees us as his son, clean and purified and washed on the inside. And now we can go before God and now we can find the, the mercy in time of need. Now we have access to the grace of God and that presents us a place or a position of worship. Worship being the expression of adoration and reverence to God. Why? Because now we have a reason to express our love and reverence to God. Has somebody ever given you a gift? Maybe took you out and bought you dinner or lunch. Maybe bought you a pair of shoes or a t-shirt or, or a CD or something like that. You know when you get a gift, you instantly feel that, man, uh, thanks. I, I don't know what to say. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful. When worship and faith begins to recognize that it's not us that makes us righteous, but Jesus. It's like receiving that gift. Our heart is flooded with the love of God. And now all of a sudden we realize, man, I've got a value. There's a purpose in my life. I, I, I feel like I'm worthless. I feel like I'm, I'm useless. I feel like there's no reason. But God saw so much reason in me to, to give Jesus, to wash me from the inside out. And God, I can't help but to worship you. God, I can't help but to give you my life. God, I can't help but to live for you. Amen. Like Romans, the 12th chapter tells us in verse number one. Finally, my brethren, he says, I beseech you, my brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, your extension of gratitude, your worship to God in faith. In faith meaning you may not see or feel any different today. You may want to bury your head in the sand in the morning, but Jesus Christ has done something on the inside of you. And through faith, you can go to God and express your adoration, express your, your reverence to God and say to God, I give you not just the words of my lips, but the heart cry of my life. And I begin to worship you, not just in my action, but my life becomes worship to God. And that's where we take it the step further of faith and worship is worship is not what we do with song. Worship is what we do with our lives. Huge. Verse number two, Paul says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. I think that that was a pretty good transformation right about there. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may do what? Prove what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So often we get wrapped up in worship. We get wrapped up in Christianity as what can I do? Now that Jesus Christ has washed me from the inside, that means I can do whatever I want because I'm good with God. Pastor Luke, you said it yourself. Righteousness isn't based on, on what I do. It's based on Jesus. So if Jesus washed me, I'm good. I can keep smoking what I smoke. I can keep drinking what I drink. I can keep snorting what I snort. I can keep doing, doing what I'm doing with somebody else. You know what I'm talking about. The young people, especially, would like to come here. Pastor Luke, man, can I keep living with my girlfriend even though I got saved? Pastor Luke, can I keep smoking what I'm smoking even though I got saved? Uh, grace. Mercy. Right? All things are lawful, but not all things are profitable, the Bible says. Worship takes it one step further, like Paul said, to prove what is the good and acceptable will of God. Listen, understand this. Christianity, church, is not about what you can and cannot do. That is religion. Laws. Regulations. Christianity is not what can I do and what can I no longer do. Christianity is I have been washed by the blood of Jesus Christ and on the inside I am clean, I am pure, which means I no longer want to or have the desire or have the need to smoke, to do the drinking, to do the drugs, to do the sleeping around, to do all the different things that I did before. Why? It's because I don't need that. Why? Because that doesn't define me. Why? Because righteousness is not a state of mind. Righteousness is a matter of fact. I'll even take it further like this. Right Righteousness is not how you feel. Righteousness is your identity. And because righteousness is your identity, you now worship God with your life. Not what you can and what you cannot do. But you say, God, I'm so grateful. A position of gratitude. God, I, I, I'm so 
thankful, a position of reverence. God, I, I, I'm, I'm so indebted to you because of what you've done to me. A position of my life that I give to you openly and willfully and glad my life to worship you. And that brings us to this last and concluding thought of Hebrews 11 chapter. And it says that through it, Abel, through his faith and worship, through his faith, through his gift to God, through it, being dead still speaks. You see, faith and worship leaves a legacy far beyond your existence here on earth. Here's a man we know very little about. We know that Abel was the second born of Adam and Eve. We know that Abel was a shepherd. We know that Abel brought the firstborn of his flock. We know that God respected Abel and his offering. And we know that Cain killed Abel. That's all we know about Abel. Yet here he is, the very first example in the hall of faith, of faith in action, recorded as a legacy. Why? Because his faith and worship, his, his adoration, his expression of, of reverence to God, his life serves as an example that even though he is dead and gone, generations and generations and generations and generations later, we are still hearing and learning of this man. Your faith and worship will leave a legacy far beyond your existence here on earth. You see, your faith and worship will leave a legacy to your children, to your children's children. Your faith and worship will leave a legacy to your family, will leave a legacy to the people that you know, that you work with, to the people that you interact with, that they will look to you and they will say about you when you are gone, that you followed God. That you were justified like, like Abel. That you had a witness. His name is Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for you. That you are a person and a child of God. And it will go far beyond your life. Just yesterday I was talking with dad. Dad was talking about inheritance. And man, I just really want to leave my kids a really good inheritance. And he's doing all, trying to do all these different business things. And I just said, dad, listen, that's great. I'm so grateful that you want to leave us an inheritance. And when you die, some money in my bank account, that's great. That's wonderful. But you have already given to me the best inheritance I can have. You taught me about Jesus Christ. You taught me about a life worth living. That is the greatest inheritance I could ever have. And because of him, because of his faith and worship, I serve God. Because of his faith and worship, my children grow up knowing who Jesus Christ is. That is a legacy that lives far beyond our existence here on earth. And so we see that in the subject of faith and worship, worship is not just a slow song. Worship is the expression of adoration and reverence to God, that we do that with all of our heart. Worship is about our heart, but then we take it one step further. Because of our position of righteousness and right standing with God, worship is because Jesus Christ made us right. Now we can worship with all of our lives, and they are a living sacrifice, proving what is the good, acceptable, and holy will of God. Church. It's so important for us to understand our position with God is based on Jesus, not on us. Why? Because you're going to walk out of this place and at some point in your life you're going to trip and fall. And if it's based on what you do, you won't get back up. But when you realize that it's based on Jesus, you pick yourself up, wipe the dust off, go to God, and keep pressing forward. Because your position is not a state of mind. It's not how you feel. It's your identity. And if God says, those who believe in Jesus, when we believe our faith, backed by our life in action, follows after Jesus Christ, God speaks of us that we are the righteousness of God through Christ. Did you guys get something out of the Word of God today? Hey, listen, before we leave, two things I want to do. Number one, I want to tell you what it was so that you don't think that it was a magic trick. It's just chemistry. Simple chemistry 101. That's water in bleach, or bleach in water and, and, and iodine in water. That's all it is. One of them's acidic, one of them's base or uh, alkaline. When you pour the two together, they neutralize each that, That's it, not magic. You're like, man. But now you can take it home and show your kids. Look at this. Jesus washes our sins away. Cool. All right. Don't tell the third service. Okay? Don't ruin the, don't ruin the, 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 the surprise. All right. Hey, listen, before we leave today, I want to just take a quick moment. 
It would be a travesty, it would be a shame for us to, to leave under the assumption, especially after what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks, to just leave under the pretense that everybody's good and okay with God. Everybody's in right standing with God. So I want to ask you a question. I just want you to answer it to yourself. Be honest. Don't pat it. Don't try to make it better than it is. Be, be open and honest. Because ultimately nobody knows the answer except you and God. The, the question is, is, if you were to leave today and you were to die, would you go to heaven or would you go to hell? It's so simple. A question. How you answer that really has a lot to say with your position with God. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that you can think, that you can hope, that you can want, that you can wish, or you can desire? Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because your parents told you as a child that you were a Christian. Nowhere does it say that because you went to church on Christmas and on Easter. Nowhere does it say that because you were baptized or christened as a baby. Nowhere will you find that because uh, you went to Sunday school or catechism classes or youth group or children's ministry. Nowhere will you find anywhere in the Word of God that because you did any of those things or because you think or hope any of those things that you're going to get into heaven. You can't get to heaven because you call yourself a Christian, because you've given yourself the label. Hey, you can't get to heaven because you sit in church. Nowhere in the Word of God does it say that because you volunteer in the children's or the ushers or you sing in the choir. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you do good things. I give to charitable organizations. I don't cheat on my taxes. I try to drive the speed limit on the freeway. Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you do good things, you're going to get into heaven? Why? Because we saw that. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So nothing you can do on your own, nothing you can do will make you good enough. You can't come to church enough. You can't pray enough prayers. You can't do enough good deeds. You can't by system of default or classification because you're not a Hindu or Buddhist or a Muslim or anything else. You can't by anything get into heaven except God's way. Today we saw that through the belief in Jesus Christ. Jesus says these words, that he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one goes to the Father except through him. So today I want to give you that opportunity to ensure your place with God in heaven forever and ever, leaving hell behind. Jesus says these words. He gives us clear instructions in the book of John. When he speaks to a religious man, he says, in order to inherit eternal life, you must be born again. Ah, born again. Listen, it's not what Hollywood, not what the internet or society's made it out to be. You think weirdo, crazy, out of control Christianity, but born again from the beginning to the end of the Bible has always meant the same thing. Here it is. It means that you've given God all of your heart. You've given God all of your life. It's an all or nothing relationship with God. We read that today. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, all of your heart, all of your life, in a relationship with God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. The Bible tells us in Revelation, Jesus is speaking to the church and he says that he's coming back and when he comes back, he better find us the church hot or he'd rather find us cold. Because he says, if I find you lukewarm, Jesus says, I will vomit you from my mouth. Shocking statement. And what he's saying is that Christians who think that are lukewarm Christians are not real Christians at all. They'll be rejected, ejected. How about this? They'll be expelled from the kingdom of God. What does it mean to be lukewarm? Simply put, it means you've got your ups and your downs, your ins and your outs, occasional church attendance, token prayer, doing your own thing, doing some of God's thing. You're not wholehearted for God. You're not wholehearted against God. You're riding the fence. Listen, if that's you, I love you enough. I respect you enough. I honor you enough today to tell you the truth. You can't think. You can't hope. You can't work. You can't wish your way into heaven. The only way you can get to heaven is God's way through Jesus Christ by giving him all of your heart, by giving him all of your life. Jesus said these words. He said that if you confess him before men, he will confess you before his father. Today, I want to give you that opportunity. You see, God respected you so much that he gave you intellect, the wits, to hear, to understand, and to either accept or to reject. It's your free will choice. God's not a manipulator. He's not a conniver. Listen, he's not in heaven with a two by four waiting to whack you over the head because you've done some stupid things. He's not like a little kid sitting on an anthill with a magnifying glass trying to burn him up with the sunlight because you've done some bad things. God loved you so much. He loved me so much that he gave Jesus, his only begotten son, to be sin so that we could be the righteousness of God through him. And it starts by accepting the gift of salvation. The Bible says that the gift of God is eternal salvation through Jesus Christ. Today, it's your choice, free will choice. And I'm gonna do something in just a moment. I'm gonna count to three. I'll go one, two, three, just like that. I'll smack my hands together. Bang. And when I do, I'm gonna ask you to do something. I'm gonna ask you something real bold. I'm gonna ask you to pop your hand up. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, Pastor Luke, today, I wanna give my heart. I wanna give my life to Jesus Christ. Today, that's me. I want to make that decision to follow Jesus. You see, Jesus said these words. He said that if you confess him before men, he'll confess you before his father. He says, but if you deny him, he will deny you before his father. The decision's yours. You can make the decision. You can start to follow through with it. Or you can sit there and do nothing. He won't force you either way. 
It's your call. So who should raise their hands? If you've never given your heart, you've never given your life to Jesus, if that's you in just a moment, get ready. If you're not sure, maybe you did this in the youth group or in the children, or maybe you went to a Harvest Crusade or you prayed that prayer on TV once before, but you never really followed through with it. If that's you in just a moment, get ready. This is your moment. This is your time. Maybe you've been living lukewarm, doing your own thing instead of God's thing. You haven't been wholehearted for God. You've been worshiping God your way. Now it's time to come to God His way with all of your heart, with all of your life. And it starts by making that decision. You see, I'm a man. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge your hand. You can put it right back down. We'll go together from there. It's your choice. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, from the front to the back, from the side to side, you guys in the family rooms, I can see you through the windows. Even if you're around the campus watching by television or at home on the live stream, wherever you're at, this is your moment. The Bible says it's the goodness of God that draws men to repentance. It's not me. It's not the person next to you. It's between you and God and you and God alone. Don't waste another minute of uncertainty. Today is the day for you, the day of your salvation. I don't care if you've been in this place for an hour or 26 years at this church. What matters is your position with God. And it starts by making that decision and following through. So I'm going to count to three wherever you're at. If that's you in this place, in just a moment, get ready. Pop your hand up. I'll see it. I'll acknowledge it. You can put it right back down and we'll go forward together from there. You ready? Here we go. One, two, three. Let me see your hands in this place today. One, two, three. I see you guys right over there. Three wise people. Uh, anybody over here? I don't see anybody. Three wise people. Four, I got you. Five, I got you. Six, I got you back there in the very back. Six wise people. Seven. How many in the family room? One. Okay, seven wise people back there. I got you back there in the back, my man. Seven wise people. Anybody else? Eight back over there. All right, I got you. Eight wise people. Anybody else? You say, man, I wonder if I should. You should. This is your moment. This is your time. Stop trying to do things your way. How many in the foyer? One. All right, that's nine. Where are you at number 10? Say, man, I wonder if I should. Come on, I haven't embarrassed them. All right, I see a 10 over there. Say, man, I wonder if I should. This is your moment. This is your time. Anybody else? I'm going to close it up. Your opportunity right here, right now. 10 wise people. I didn't embarrass them. I won't embarrass you. Anybody else? Praise God for 10 wise people. Hallelujah. Amen. Here's what we're going to do. In just a moment, we're all going to stand. Elijah's going to sing a song. For those of you that raise your hand, if you're in the family room, hey, listen, the ushers, they'll come help you get your stuff. Baby's got a lot of baggage, I understand. Whether you're in the front row, the back row, wherever you're at, if you raise your hand, you don't get saved by raising your hand. You say, I want to. Now it's time to follow through with that decision, to put action to your belief. We're going to do that together right here, right now. So if you raise your hand, or you should have raised your hand in a moment. When everybody stands, I want you to grab your coat, your sweater, your purse, your Bible. A friend, if you need a friend, I want you to get out of your seat, get out of your chair. Get into the aisle and come meet me right here. If you came with somebody, look at them and just say, hey, will you come with me? Or maybe you brought somebody or you saw somebody next to you. Just look at them and say, hey, you know what? I'll go with you. Come on, let's do it together. And get out of your seat, get out of your chair and come meet me here at this altar. We're going to change destinies together right here, right now. So come on, let's all stand, please. Nobody leave as they walk forward. If that's you in this place today, wherever you're at, you come. Get out of your seat, get out of your chair. You come up here today. mercy that draws me near. My own grace, I'm standing here. And no matter it's covered my wrong See, I realize it's true and It's your mercy that draws me near My own grace, I'm standing here No matter the road I've walked it's oh, covered I my wrong. I want a big five. Give me a big one. See, That's what I realize it's true. I gotta get a big five five. Now there's none right. like you. Well, hey guys, you came. Awesome. I want to share something cool with you. You're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday celebration. It's good, man. You're making a good decision. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce a friend of mine to you. See this guy right over here waving at you? His name's Dr. Becker. We call him Dr. B. Real easy. He's going to take you guys right over there. Nothing weird goes on, okay? You don't get saved by raising your hand. You get saved by asking Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior. What does that mean, Lord and Savior? How about this? The leader of your life. You're going to invite him to, be in your, to come in your life. We're also going to do some things. We want to give you some information, some literature. You walk out of this place and say, man, what, what do I do next? I don't know what to do. We're going to point you in the right direction. 
The last thing he's going to do is he's going to invite you to come back, to hang out. Why? We want to get you connected here at church with a friend. Somebody that will meet with you right here at church, right before service. They'll buy you a cup of coffee or a soda, sit down with you for just a couple of minutes right there before church service. You come and hang out just for a couple of weeks and teach you some things about the Word of God so that you don't go back to the life that you're walking away from, but you go forward in everything that God has for you. So if you guys would just turn to your left, my right, go right over there with Dr. Becker. Congratulations. Hallelujah. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me. Go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Thank you for listening to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center. If this message spoke to you, please share it with us. We'd love to hear from you. You can find more information at www.rockchurch.com.